Good afternoon today. Uh, today's lecture will be about parsing. And you remember we talked about parser. First the scanner tokenizes the input and the parser builds parse trees or not necessarily, but it goes through the input and the rules of the grammar in a way that it could build a parse tree or a syntax tree, which is a simplified parse tree. So you remember we had, we can have a grammar. Let's say a statement in a programming language consists of many things, but it could be an if token, a left parenthesis, and then an expression, a right parenthesis, and another statement. And obviously you can have more statements than just this. And the uh, parse tree, or concrete syntax tree, will be something like this. And if you have actual input down here, if left x to y equals 8, then this is the if, this is the left parenthesis, then you have an expression which consists of this, uh, you have the right parenthesis, and you have the other statement which is this one. There will probably be more levels down here with the expression. But, uh, if we assume a very simple grammar, this is how it could look. Uh, we haven't said anything about how to build this parse tree yet, so that will be today's uh, event. Uh, when you build a tree, you can start from the top. Okay, I'm going to parse a statement, and then you can build it top-down. You could also start from down here and work yourself upwards, uh, bottom up. The top-down method is the simpler one. And it's the one we're going to use today to show how to write a parse, or how to do parsing uh, by hand, or not exactly by hand, but to write a hand-coded parser in normal C or some other similar language that works from the top down. It's easier to do, but there are some limits on how the grammar can look. You have constraints on what types of grammar you can parse with this simpler top-down method. Uh, parsing bottom-up is more difficult to do, but you have less constraints on the grammar, so uh, bottom-up parsers can work with a larger class of grammars than top-down parsing can do. So, if you, do a, uh, if you write a parser by hand, you usually use top-down, because it's simpler. If you have a tool, a parser generator like Bison, then these typically work with bottom-up parser, or they generate a bottom-up parser. Because, well, it's more difficult to do, but it's a tool, so it can work uh, <coughs> as much as we want it to. And you have fewer constraints on the grammar. But today we'll be top down. And we're going to use an example from the old version of the book. Uh, the new one, the new edition has a parser in. Uh, uh, it parses a subset of Java, I think, which um, pedagogically the older example is much better because it uses uh, data types in Pascal. So, <coughs> if you in C write something like this, okay, here you have the data type, and here you have the variable, and you need to mix them together when you have uh, complicated data types. In Pascal, it is much easier. You say 
var as in variable. And then you give the name, a colon, and a data type. And in the case of integer, it is called integer. So these data types, uh, integer and so on, we will parse. So examples of data types, as I said, integer. You also have char as in character. Uh, you can have intervals, 1 to 20. That's an integer, but uh, constrained to be from 1 to 20. And if you have an array, it will be array 2 to 6 of integer, for example. So you say array square bracket and then an interval, for example, 2.6. Uh, this would be an array that starts at 2 and then 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. We have five places of integer. For arrays, you can also use a data type. So if you say char, then that will be uh, an array of, assuming 8-bit characters, 256 uh, places of integer. And <coughs> the data type of the things you have in the array uh, can be anything. So you can have, for example, an array of arrays. You can have array 1 to 10 of array. One, two, three of, well, let's say 2.6. So you have here a matrix, uh, a 10 by 3 matrix of the numbers 2 to 6. A grammar for this. Well, <coughs> a data type can be, so let's say a, a type, it can be a simple data type, such as integer. or char, or another type of simple data type is um, a number followed by the token dot dot, the two points, uh, and another number. So you can have an interval. And notice now that dot dot is one token. So it's like in C++ or in C where you can write I++. This is one token. It is not two plus tokens after each other. So you can't write, for example, this. This would be a syntax error. And in the same way here, you need to write the two dots after each other. So they form one single token. A data type can be a simple one, or you can have an array. So, array simple of type. So, why does it say simple inside the brackets? Well, the size and the, uh, the uh, numbers of the places in the array can be either a, an interval, num, dot, dot, num, or it can be sure, and it can even be integer, although an array with a place for each possible integer would be rather large. Uh, well, on a modern computer it, mi it might wor very well work. 
And you can have pointers also. This up arrow, which has some sort of name in French, I think. Uh, <coughs> pointer to type. We will parse a source program that looks like this. Array, square bracket, one point point ten, end square bracket, of integer. And let, let me remove these semicolons here. I mean, <coughs> they would be part of this variable declaration. They're not really part of the data type. So, um, So how do we build this parse tree top down? Well, first of all, the scanner will tokenize this. You have the array keyword. You have this uh, starting square bracket. You have a number. You have the dot dot. You have another number. You have the end bracket and the keyword of and the keyword integer. So how do we build a parse tree for this? Well, <coughs> typical parsers, almost all parsers, read the tokens one after each other and looks at one token at a time. So if I write the tokens down here and then have a parse tree uh, above here. So if you're drawing this, then leave some space above here. Uh, the first token is array, and now we know, we assume we know that we want to parse a data type. We are somewhere in the program where here comes a data type, so we need to parse it. Or that was the start symbol for the entire language, so um, <coughs> the entire input will, will match. Uh, a type. Okay, so we have three rules about what a type can be. This one, this one, and this one. And if we look at those three rules and we look at that token, which one of the rules will we use? Yeah, exactly. Because if you look at the start, this one starts with an up arrow. This one starts with, well, it's not going to say simple in the input because simple is a non-terminal. So a simple can be either integer, char, or this one, num, dot, dot, num. So it will start with either integer, char, or num. But this one starts with array. So we know that that is the rule we must use, the production we must use. And how, if I start from up here, array, simple of type. We know that the next token, unless there is a syntax error, the next token will be a square bracket, and then a simple data type, then an end square bracket, and then the keyword of and a type of some kind. So again, we look at one token at a time. The next token we look at is, oh, it's a square bracket, which is what we want it to be. It must be a square bracket, otherwise we have a syntax error. So this token goes in the tree there. 
Then we have a simple. Here comes, according to the grammar, a simple data type. So, which one is it? Well, again, we look at the next token, this number. We look at the three different rules for what a simple can be. It can be integer, char, or num, dot, dot, num. So, which one will we use? This one. <coughs> because, well, it's a number, so obviously we'll use that one. So, it says num here. This one, and then there will be, we hope, dot, dot, and num. Uh, otherwise, there's an error. So, we read the next token. Oh, it is. Uh, dot dot, very nice. So, and the next one, oh, it's num as we want it to be. So, here we have built this uh, uh, simple data type. Now, what should come next? Uh, yeah, according to this grammar here, after the simple data type comes an n square bracket. And, lucky we are, here we have an n square bracket. And this one. <clears throat> and as you can see, we're building from the top and from the left here. Then comes the, uh, or should come the token of, and it does. So, Let's write it down here and remove that one. So, so. And finally, there should be a type. We're here now. Some type and which rule is it? First one. The first one, yes. Because it says integer, so it can't be this one, it can't be this one. But it can be this one, because a simple can be num, char, or integer as the first token. So we're using this one. And the type expands to simple, and then simple to integer, which is the next token we got here. So now we have built the parse tree from the top down. This is what is in more theoretical context called an LL1 parser. The first L stands for left, which means you read the tokens from the left. I mean, in the source code, you start from the beginning. So almost all parsers do this. Uh, the second L means that you build the tree from the left. So you read the tokens in the source from left, from the first and so on. Uh, you build the tree from left. And the one means one token look ahead. Because all the time we looked at just one single token, the next token. So we could decide which rule to use. top-down parser. And this version is also called a predictive parser. And why is it called a predictive parser? Well, <coughs> because there was never any doubt about which rule to use. We could always predict which, one, which rule is the right one. Uh, we never have Another way to describe this is that we never have two rules for the same non-terminal, for example, type here, that start with the same token. Can you repeat what you mean by one? Say again? Uh, one means that we only look at one token. We don't need to look, oh, how, ma how many tokens do we need to look at? No, we just look at the, the next token in the input.
I should also say, <coughs> uh, mention the term look ahead token. Look a hiad. Look ahead token. That is the next token we're looking at. Uh, or current token. If we have two different rules that start with the same token, and there is a very nice example in Swedish, I can't translate it to English though because then it becomes different. In Swedish, uh, <coughs> we have two commands that can be used in a, on a shooting range or in a military context. Eld, which means fire, and Eld upphör, which means ceasefire. So, <clears throat> if you get the input, someone shouts Eld or fire, uh, <clears throat> you don't know which of these rules you're going to use. So, you could not build this type of predictive parser for this very simple language. Because, hey, I don't know, is it stop, does it stop here, or will the next word be upphör? For fire cease, if we try to translate it to English. So, what would we have to do there? Well, <coughs> We still want to have only one token look ahead. I mean, if we have two tokens look ahead, I look at the next two tokens. Oh, here, there, here there, only, there is only one token, or maybe I can see that, oh, here we have a second token. Then I could, of course, match if I have an LL2 parser. But if I only look at this and don't know what comes left, <coughs> well, what I can do is I can guess. I'm going to build a command, and here comes the token, eld. So, let's guess it's eld upor. And then I look at the next token, and if it is upor, well, nice, I guessed correctly. But if it's not, if the input ends there or something else comes, then I need to backtrack. I guessed wrong, so I need to go back and guess again. So that would not be a predictive parser, that would be a parser with backtracking. Okay? So we're going to do this as a program um, in a C like language. And obviously it will be simpler if we have a you can do a predictive parser. Because if you want to do backtracking, then you might need to build some data structure that you can go back in. And we don't want to do that. So, the parser. We're going to do something that's called a recursive descent parser, and actually a predictive recursive descent parser. Predictive recursive dis descent parser. And what recursive descent means is that you start up here, you descend through the, the tree you're building, and you will recursively uh, parse things such as type. Here comes type again. So when we write a program, we will have a recursive program that <coughs> has some code to parse a type, and then it might in some circumstances, 
call that same part of the program to uh, match the type inside the type. Okay? So what we'll do is we will write one procedure or in C function uh, for each non-terminal. One function or what I mean is a part of the program with a name so you can call it, subroutine. One function for each non-terminal. I will assume there is a scanner. So we have a function that's called scan, that is the scanner and returns the next token. I will also have a variable called look ahead. And that will be a variable that contains the look ahead token. So we start by calling scan and put the result of that scan in the look-ahead variable. So here, for example, now um, look-ahead will contain array, the first token in the input. We also had uh, <coughs> matching against things. Uh, at several places we said that Oh, here there's supposed to come a starting a square bracket, or here there's supposed to come a number. So we'll write a function that just checks that the next token really is what we suppose it to be. So here is a function called match, uh, which expected. Uh, I assume now that each token has a number that describes which token it is. Uh, if we use um, um, a data type that describes tokens, you could of course say that this is the data type token. But when we do it for real, we will just use integers. So maybe array is coded as uh, 65 and left uh, bracket is called 70 or, so, or something, some numbers. And what I do is I check that look ahead is the expected one. Or rather, if it's not the expected one, I call an error function. If look ahead is not the expected token, I mean, we were here and instead of this square bracket we got the plus sign, uh, then there's an error. And we also assume that this error function just uh, prints an error message and terminates the, uh, um, the parser. Uh, real compilers do all sorts of things to be able to get on track again, to find, well, what was the problem? How can we fix it? Can we go on parsing after this problem to give lots of nice error messages and warnings? But uh, we are content that our parser just terminates and says error. Okay, match will do one more thing. It will call scan again to get the next token. Because when I check that, oh, this actually is a square bracket, then of course I want to look at the next token. So at the end here I say look ahead equals scan. So this, this is the match function.
So, what do we say? We say we will have one function for each non-terminal. So we'll have one called simple and one called type. And if we start with simple, let's see if I can, I delete this. The function simple, which is called whenever we want to parse a simple data type. So, for example, when we got here and found that, okay, array, square bracket, and now there should come a simple, then we call this function called simple. So, what it will do is we look at the input and see which one of these simple things it is. And how do I know which of these three rules for simple we want to use? Well, we'll look at the next token. If it is integer, then, and this is the keyword integer, it does not mean a number. A number, as you remember, is called num here. Uh, if the input is integer, then we match integer. So if look ahead equals integer, then I found the data type integer. Uh, <coughs> and you remember the match function, which just steps over this. Now, of course, I already know that since I did this check, the check inside match that it actually is an integer is unnecessary. So I, I could just uh, write look ahead equals scan to get the next token. But to be consistent and do the same thing all the time, I will call match. Okay. If look ahead was integer, fine. Else it could be sure. And I'm not going to write just, just if look ahead equals char here, because why would that be wrong? Well, this one stepped over the integer keyword in the input. And if the next one is char, well, I don't want to match it here because I'm still in matching this instance of simple. So I need an else here. If look ahead equals integer, okay, fine else see if it's sure in that case match sure or rather just step over this sure keyword else if look ahead equals well the third possible simple is num dot dot num so if it's num, well, then I know it's supposed to be that one. And let's um, call first match the num that I've already checked. I already know that here comes a number. Then I need to match the dot dot. And then I need to match or step over the second number here in this interval simple data type. Okay, so for example here, <coughs> oh, <coughs> it's not integer, it's not sure, but it's a number. So I step over that one, I step over that one and check that it's dot dot, and I step over that one and also check that it's number. And we already know that this is number because we just checked it, but these could be wrong. I mean, I could have mistakenly put a comma here instead of dot dot. And then I will get an error message from matching dot dot because there is no dot dot there. Okay. What if none of these are true. 
I mean, I did not write integer, I did not write char, I did not write a number dot dot another number. I wrote, for example, x or plus. Well, then it's a syntax error because you can't write that according to the grammar. So, in that case, error. And that is the end of the function simple, which matches a simple data type. Integer, char, or number, dot, dot, number. And as we said, predictive parser, it can always know, it always knows which rule is the right one, because, well, it either starts with integer, char, or a number, or something else which is an error. So we have matched um, a simple. Okay. Let's then look at our next function, which is of course type. We have three different productions for type. And again, we'll write a series of if statements, depending on what the next token is. And by the way, um, <coughs> this is not exactly correct C code. For example, this is a keyword in C, so this would fail if you ran it through a C compiler. If, again, we look at the next token, the look ahead token, and let's see. The first rule, what should I match against? Mm, if I write this, or rather if you do this, you will fail the exam because <coughs> the input will never contain a keyword called simple or a token called simple because that is just something we, uh, a name we give to part of the input. So you can't match against simple. What part can you match against? Well, what you can do is, I mean, what can a simple start with? It can start with integer, char, and num. So, <clears throat> there is something called the first set. The first set of simple. That is, the tokens that a simple can start with. And what it is, is, yes, integer, and also Sure and num. So you have a set of tokens that a simple can start with. So instead of this thing which is wrong, uh, I say that okay, if look ahead equals integer or look ahead equals sure or look ahead equals num. Well, then I know that it's a simple. And how do I parse a simple? Because now I have found a simple in the input. I found a simple data type. Do I need to write an if statement here if it's a, dot, if it's a number, if it's an integer? No, because we just wrote a function that parses a simple. So I just call that one. So here I call the function simple, which parses a simple for us. Else, <coughs> if the look ahead token was not integer, it was not char and not num, I will look at the next or the other productions for type. And for example, array, 
the one we used here. Well, else if look ahead equals array, then I will, well, first of all, you remember what we did. We step over array. So let's put a bracket there. I match the keyword array, which steps over the key, the token array, because I, I already know it's, it says array because I just checked it. But then I also need to match this square bracket. And again, this is not real uh, valid C code. I would have uh, some sort of macros that defines numbers instead. So I match the square bracket. What comes then? A simple, yes. And again, I just call the function simple, which matches the complete simple. And then uh, afterwards I should get, I hope there is a n square bracket in the input, because otherwise match will print the same message about an error. And then uh, we have off, match all. And finally, what does the production for an array type say at the end after the of keyword? Type, type yeah. So I match a type. And now you see why it's called recursive descent. I'm calling type again. And we have one rule, one production left. This one, up arrow, which means pointer in Pascal. Else if look ahead equals up arrow. Then, oh, I need to. On this. Uh, if it's an up arrow, then first I match uh, the up arrow and then comes any data type. So I call type again to match, well, some data type that I have a pointer to. Are we finished? Else error, exactly, because if I do all this and we get a completely wrong input, it start, the input starts with a plus, then it would say, oh, it's not, it's not, it's not that, not that, not that. Oh, okay. <clears throat> it would match nothing, but it wouldn't say anything. So if I leave it like this, it means that anything will match. So I have to add else error. That was supposed to be in. So now we take a break. So let's uh, continue. Yeah, uh, we saw that we can write this recursive descent parser. Uh, we can write our recursive descent parser using uh, one function for each non-terminal. In this case, simple and type. And it is not really that complicated because we always know which rule to use. We know which uh, branch of the if statement to go into. Uh, we never will make a mistake and have to backtrack. So that's the advantage of having a predictive parser. Yeah. There are, however, some things that we need to 
uh, ensure of the grammar before we do this. And the first one is, of course, that <coughs> the first sets should be disjoint. That is why it is predicted. I mean, <coughs> I know which rule to use because I can look at the next token. And I know which part of the uh, uh, if statement to go into. If I don't know that, let's go back to this uh, shooting range command language in Swedish. Fire and cease fire, except in Swedish, fire and fire cease. Fire, and fire sees. Uh, <coughs> the parser will look something like this. Void command. If look ahead equals eld, fire, then Match L because that's this one. Else, if all well, the other one is exactly the same, if look ahead equals L match first L and then match a poor. And obviously, this doesn't work because, well, if I see the token L, which one to use? So what I can do is something that's called left factoring of the grammar. I transform this grammar, this one, into a new grammar that says a command starts with eld, and then comes a rest. The rest, then, can be either a pearl, ceasefire, or nothing. Now, there is no confusion. If I see the token eld, and then I don't know what comes. Well, I only have one rule to go to, so it's this one, and then I call rest, and then it depends on what comes later, if it says upper or not. So I either go into that rule or that one. Remove it, so. Left factoring. And why is it called left factoring? Well, it's from mathematics. If you have xy plus xz, you can factor out x here. And say x times, and then a parenthesis with y plus z. And that's the same thing you do there. You factor out this first token, and then the rest non-terminal uh, corresponds to the parenthesis, that is either this or that. Okay? Yes? Repeat the last part. Uh, left factoring in mathematics. If you have x times y <coughs> plus x times z, you can rewrite it as x times and then a parenthesis y plus z. And it is similar to what we do here. I mean, we have eld or eld upper. So I factor out the eld like, like I factored out x here. And call the part which is either upper or nothing, uh, I call it rest. It corresponds to the parenthesis x plus, uh, y plus z. Okay. That's the easy problem that a grammar can have. 
We have another problem, which is called left recursion. Yes. I'm just kind of confused there what a void command there. If look at half, when it's equal to L. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. this, this is the problem. I mean, this does not work. Uh -huh, yeah. Because I don't, know, I don't know if to go into this one or that one. So this is a problem. That's why we need to uh, left factor the grammar to remove these first conflicts that we have here. Okay? Left recursion. It is not like left factoring something you do to fix the grammar. Left recursion is the problem. Uh, let's say you have a grammar that says that you have expressions and an expression can be either a uh, number or it can be an expression plus a number. So plus a number or we assume tokens and expression is a non-terminal. And the problem here is this production here. That an expression can be expanded to an expression plus a number. So what is the recursion here? Well, the recursion is that an expression is <coughs> expressed uh, in terms of expressions. An expression is an expression plus a number. And left recursion, uh, the leftmost part of the right side of this production. Left recursion. And why is this a problem? Well, let's look at the code. So an expression starts with, well, it must start with a number, because that's, uh, I only have numbers and then I can add them together with plus. So I look at if look ahead equals number, then I will use this production. And you remember how the code looks? Well, I call expression to parse an expression, and then I match plus and I match number. So the code here will look something like this. Expression match plus match number. And, well, we may have other uh, productions here. But this part here, what is the problem here? Let's see what happens when we try to use this code to parse this input. I mean, uh, the token here, it's a number, and this is a number, and this is a number. And this is when we start the look ahead token, the first token. Okay, <clears throat> this is supposed to be an expression, so we call expression, this function. I check if look ahead equals number, yes it is. So, in that case, I will use this right-hand side from the rule there. Expression plus number. So, expression. And what do we do with expression? Well, of course, we call 
this uh, function, the same function, recursive descent, you remember? And we go in here, and if look ahead equals number, well, it's still two, it's still a number. So we will use this rule expression plus number. So I call expression, get back here, if look ahead equals number, it's still a number. I call expression, and you see I get stuck in an infinite recursion. Because I've said that an expression consists of an expression plus some more stuff. And I never consume any tokens. I never call match. I never move the look ahead token forward. All I do is see, okay, this is an expression, aha, uh -huh, okay, expression, aha, uh -huh, expression. So I'm stuck. So with a recursive descent parser like this, you can't have a left recursive parser, uh, grammar. No left recursive grammars for a top-down recursive descent. I say for a for a top-down parser uh, <coughs> of the of this type. So what do we need to do? Well, we could switch to a bottom-up parser. A bottom-up parser will not have any trouble with this grammar. But we can also rewrite the grammar or transform the grammar. There is a simple rule how to transform this left recursive grammar to a grammar that is not left recursive. So, assuming we have. Yes. Uh, the type where we started from the top and used recursive calls to build the parse tree. A parser of the type we've seen today. So we can't uh, can do it because, because we repeat the expression. Yes, okay. yes. We get stuck here. So here we have a left recursive grammar. A is any non-terminal, in this case expression, and then you have x and y which are uh, actually it can be any combination of, to uh, of uh, terminals and non-terminals. You transform this to say that A should be Y followed by a rest. And that rest is either X followed by a new rest or it is nothing. And now I know that the first time I saw this, it seemed very strange that here you have a single y. Why does it suddenly be first here in the transform grammar? Because the, this grammar is supposed to describe exactly the same language. But if you look at these two, uh, these two grammars and try to see if they describe the same language. We can start with the start symbol and expand them. So if I start with the first one, our bad left recursive grammar, I have A, which can be either AX or Y. If it's Y, then uh, we're finished. It's just a terminal, we get no further. Uh, if it's AX, well, then A can be either AX or Y, and then you need to add this X you had before. If it's YX, then you only have terminals, so you get no further. But if you have an A, you can expand that A to either 
AX or Y, and you have these two X's here, and if it's YXS, YXX, then <coughs> you get no further, but if it's A, and so on. So I think if you look at this expansion from the start symbol, it seems that the language is first a Y, followed by zero or more X's. Right? The second grammar. A is, well, you only have one expansion. Y followed by rest. And then you can look at rest, which is either X, rest, or nothing. And you need to keep this Y from the start here. And if you have Y, you have only terminals, so you get you stop there. But here you can expand rest to be either X rest or nothing. And you need to keep this YX. And if you have YX, you stop there. But if you have rest, you can expand that to X rest or nothing. And you need to keep YXX. YXX, and you stop there, and then you can go on here. And as you see, again, you have a single Y followed by zero or more Xs. So it seems that, yes, <coughs> this transformation rule uh, preserves the language. It's the same language. Now, When you write the parser, it will look something like this, void expr, and what you have there is match the single y, and call rest, because that is the only uh, expansion, the only production of A. So you have no if statement at all. And you don't even need uh, <coughs> to check for error because match Y will match Y, otherwise you get an error. And then rest, oh correction, uh, rest will check that the rest matches, otherwise you'll get an error there. And here you have void rest. And how do we match against these two things? Well, first of all, if it starts with an X, if look ahead equals X, then we have this rule. So I match the X, or rather step over the X and go to the next token, and then I call rest recursively. So here, since we don't have left recursion, we have put something before the recursion. I will consume tokens from the input, so I don't get stuck the same way I did before. Else, well, this is the interesting part, what, the interesting part here. What should I do? with this production here. Should I check that the input is empty? Or what should I check against? Match empty. Well, if I try again, this is not something that ever is in the input. This is just something we use uh, in the grammar. <coughs> now, the thing is, if I have an expression, 2 plus 3 plus 4, anything, let's uh, use a bracket. Here is the sequence of input. The thing is, <coughs> you will get here, and then 
we have reached the end and here we should match against, well, we shouldn't match against anything because what it says is empty, no tokens. And you can always put no tokens anywhere. So I don't do anything. I just say, okay. Because, for example, <coughs> if I do something more reasonable, uh, here we have an expression. So I parse 2 plus 3 plus 4. Yes, I'm finished. Here comes the end. Match nothing. Well, as I said, you can always put no tokens here because you can always fit no tokens anywhere. So it's okay. You're finished. You have matched this expression. And then, of course, when we go back, <coughs> because this seems to be part of something else, for example, part of an array declaration. And then there, in that part of the parser, you will check that it actually is uh, an end bracket matching this start bracket. But the expression, it can be anything afterwards. You just stop when it is no longer a plus sign. Okay? And maybe I forgot to actually write the grammar for expression. Um, <coughs> expression is number followed by rest and the rest is plus number rest or nothing. So an expression is a number and then comes a rest which can be, be plus a number followed by another rest or it can be empty. So, this was removing left recursion. You rewrite the grammar according to these rules here. It will match the same language, but of course the parse tree will be different because now you have a different grammar with different non-terminals. For example, rest did not exist before. Okay? How to write a top down horser? Well, the first step is, of course, to decide the language. Will it be infix, postfix? What will you be able to do in the language? That is, the set of all allowed inputs to this system. Write a grammar for that language. Remove ambiguity. You remember we talked about ambiguous grammars. If you have a grammar that says that 2 plus 2 plus 2 can either be parsed as 2 plus 2 plus 2, which is what we usually call the normal thing, or you can group things together instead like this. I mean, is it left associative or right associative? 
<coughs> if you have ambiguities like this, then you need to decide which one is the correct one. What, how do you want your language to work? And in this particular case with addition, you probably want this one. Otherwise you will be, you will be confusing people. You decide <coughs> which parse tree, which way you're parsing is the correct one. And then um, you might need to remove first conflicts. And as you remember, a first conflict is when you have two productions for the same non-terminal, such as eld and elduperm then you need to remove this first conflict by left factoring. Also left recursion Write the parser. In C or Java or uh, Python or whatever language you like. Or this part here. Or use a tool like Bison. which is a parser generator, you feed it the grammar. You basically feed it the grammar and it creates a parser for you. You don't need to remove first conflicts and left recursion because those constraints on how the grammar can look is only for these type of predictive top-down parsers, uh, not for Bison. Can you explain what fast conflicts are? Uh, it is when you have, uh, let's, um, um, when you have a rule that says A is either X, Y or X, Z, and then you have your input starts with X. So which rule is the right one? Which production is the, the correct one to use here? Well, you don't know because this matches both this and this. And the first set is what can a thing start with? Well, x, y, this part uh, starts with uh, not x, y, it starts with just x. Uh, and the other one, the first set of x, z is also x, so you have overlapping sets here the sets are not disjoint. So you don't know, when you go into the if statement in uh, the function that parses an A, the non-terminal A, you don't know which branch of the if statement to go into. So you would need to either look further to have more than one tokens look ahead, or you need to be able to backtrack oh, I guess x, y, but then comes a z. Okay, I need to backtrack and try again. And uh, what do you mean by third point? Say again? Uh, what do you mean by third point? This one, remove ambiguity. Well, when you have a grammar that <coughs> lets you parse, for example, this one, either like this or like this, so you can build two or more different parse trees for the same input, then you have an ambiguous grammar. And if you can do that, you don't really know what your language means because you don't know how to parse it. It can be parsed in different ways. And you need to decide which one is the correct one and only allow that, allow that one, which may mean that you need to rewrite the grammar.
אוקיי? So, let's look at a very simple language. This is actually the uh, 2.5 program that's on the website, and that was in the old version of the book. The language it understands is simple expressions with plus and minus and only single digit numbers. So you can have an expression that is just 2, you can have 2 plus 3, you can have 2 plus 3 plus 4 minus 5 minus 6, but not Two times three, you can't have uh, 12 plus three because 12 is not a single digit number, and you can't have parentheses like this. So, very simple language. And of course, things that are completely wrong, like six minus plus plus, is not allowed either. Say again? Division. No division, no. Only plus and minus. And of course, since I can write division there as not, I mean, these are not allowed. Actually, I have um, the program here. So if you have it on your computer, on the website, you can look at it. Otherwise, you can get it on paper. You have it. So, <laughs> now, this is a very simple parser and it translates to uh, postfix. So 2, well it's 2 in postfix, 2 plus 3 is 2, 3 plus, and this one is uh, 2, 3 plus, 4 plus, 5 minus, 6 minus. So you get postfix for it. And if we start by writing a grammar for this language without looking at uh, how it looks here, uh, we would write something like this, <coughs> an expression is, well, it can be a simple term. I think they write term, and the term is just a digit. So a term is either zero or one or two or three or four or five or six or seven or eight or nine. But an expression can be, well, a single term like the number two, or it can be that you have an expression and add plus a term at the end. So you remember we talked about this um, in an earlier lecture. If you have an expression, two, plus three minus, plus four minus five, you can add something at the end. So you can add either expression plus term or you can add expression minus term. So this is the complete grammar for the language. Now, we don't want to only parse this in the sense of saying that, okay, it matches the grammar. This input matches the grammar or it does not matches the, match the grammar. We want to actually translate to postfix. We want to generate some output. So in this grammar, we add what is called semantic actions, which just means print some output. 
And why it's called an action? Because you perform some action, you do something. Why is it called semantic? Well, because <clears throat> the meaning of this input is what we put out here, but in a different format. So instead of this very simple grammar, we have um, something that looks like this. If an expression is a term, well, we assume that we don't need to output anything except what the term itself outputs. I mean, if the term is the number two, and it, is, it outputs two, then we're finished. But if we have the expression is an expression plus a term, what do we do then? Well, assuming that both expression and term outputs whatever is needed to calculate them, then all we have is the plus at the end. Because, you know, we're generating postfix. So let's add a print a plus at the end. So here we have a semantic action. The same with minus. Expression minus term. And print a minus at the end. Because what is postfix for this complete expression? Well, it's the postfix for this and the postfix for this with, at the end, the minus operator. And then we have the term. Well, it can be zero. And if we found the term zero, what do we do? Well, we print the zero because the postfix for zero in input is, of course, zero. So it's very simple to generate postfix code for the term zero. It is zero. And the same thing with the other ones. If you have the term one, oh, you print one. And if you have two, you print two. Like this and so on. So here you have the original grammar with semantic actions. And it is not more complicated than this. I mean, for the terms, it's just the same output as the input. Because the postfix code for the infix 1 is 1. And when you have a more complicated expression, uh, this has already printed all its output. This has already printed all its output when we get here. So we just add the minus at the end for the postfix. Now, there are a number of problems with this grammar. Not the least that it's left recursive. So <coughs> we can't write this nice recursive descent parser for it, so we need to transform it. And you remember the rule? If you have an A that expands to the same A followed by something else, and we call it X, then What is a bit, tr not tricky, but needs to be remembered, it, that the semantic actions should also be moved around with the rest of the grammar. Because you remember I said that uh, <coughs> if I transform the grammar according to these rules, I will get different parse trees. And we could see, for example, that suddenly I have made a right associative plus instead of the normal left associative that we had here. But when I move things around, and you remember that um, 
I will transform this AX or uh, something else to a y followed by a rest and the rest is either uh, x rest or nothing and if you look at the code you have now you can see that well first of all the if you look at term they have simplified a bit so they say if look ahead is a digit if is digit look ahead, then I just print it uh, and then I call match to get the next token. Else error. So they have simplified this entire part of the program. The um, you also see that you have uh, expression which when uh, when transformed when the grammar is transformed becomes this so the code for expression is just term followed by rest. Stop. Uh, we don't have time to go into this anymore, but if you look at this 2.5 program, uh, <coughs> you'll see exactly how it works. It is a predictive recursive descent parser, which top down starts with expression and then looks at, well, what is the input and builds a, well, it doesn't exactly build a parse tree, but it goes through the input according to the rules of the grammar. Uh, so it could have built the parse tree. Instead of building the parse tree, it just performs these semantic actions and prints the numbers and operators plus and minus. So you get postfix output from it. Okay, thank you for today.